Welcome back to the Meeple Marathon and our continued coverage of Now or Never by Red Raven Games and Ryan Lockett. This is the third game in his uh, Arzium Trilogy, which is where Above and Below and um, Near and Far took place. So, but this is a very different game from those two games. Uh, but there are some elements that are pulled from those games, uh, which you will notice throughout the game. For me, this one feels more like Islebound, which I never realized Islebound was not set in the uh, Arzium universe. But Islebound is a game where you're basically sailing your ship around, and um, you know you're the, the fact that you're having to move every time, and you have a definitive movement, but you know you can pretty much reach a lot of places within like two moves. And you go there and you know you have basic actions that you can take at those locations but it's all about building out your tableau of a little town that's islebound this is very similar this game is all about um uh, uh, taking your selective actions moving around this map to gather resources fight enemies things like that grow your character all in the name of being able to build up your town over here which is your engine the your town is what's going to give you resources at the end of every round so that you can use then in the next round and the better your town is uh, especially at the end of the game the more points you're going to score so um, that's really what this game is about is building up a tableau uh, and that's where you score most of your points off of um, but if you want a deeper uh, experience you can play through the game with very much uh, kind of near and far aspects where as you travel around the places that you stop at instead of just gaining a random search token are going to give you um, uh, a narrative towards your specific character and there's four characters in the game each one has their own story so if you want a more immersive journey in your building up of the town of monument then you can play it in story mode Today, we're really just going to be going through how to play the game, and then I'm going to be running through a few rounds of standard mode, just so you can kind of get a feel for how to play the game. In my next video, I will be going through chapter one of the story mode, but this way, if you are not interested in any spoilers, you can still see this video, learn how to play, see some of the gameplay. I've also flipped it over to the uh, underground side of the board so you can see what that and what changes might be with that. I know there's a lot of videos already out there of the other side so this will give you an experience of the underground side. But before we get to all that let's go ahead and talk about setup. So I'm just going to kind of work my way down here from top to bottom. So up here is the market board. This has a, a few things. Probably you know one of the most important is this market area where you can trade in your goods that you accumulate throughout the game for money. That's really the only thing the goods are used for. Now there's some quests where specific goods are needed to complete the quest, but for the most part, you're gonna be acquiring goods that you can then trade in for money to spend to buy buildings to rebuild your town. So you could see this conversions of those goods are over here. Now you can always just sell singles, but if you can get combinations of them, then they're going to be worth more points. So having a well-rounded town is far better than having, say, specializing in bottled demons, per se. So you've got your market. You also have your tracker. Basically the game is six rounds. So that's what that disc at the top is, is just keeping track of the seasons for you. Then you have your gear store. So there's red gear and blue gear. You can see that designated by this uh, little blue banner. The other one has a red banner. So you're gonna wanna divvy those up with that same looking back. Uh, shuffle them up and then you're gonna deal three into each slot. In order to purchase from the gear store, you're going to need a specialist who gives you the ability to buy gear. And so let me find one here, for example, is a specialist with the gear icon. This specialist gives you the ability to purchase from the gear store. So you can exchange your goods for money anytime without any type of special assistant. But in order to purchase gear, you need the right assistant. All right. So up next, I, especially in the standard mode, 
you use the side of the board without the reputation track. Now, if you're playing story mode, you need the reputation track. So you're gonna have to put these guys elsewhere. But um, since these guys are, uh, or since there's no reputation track in the way, I can go ahead and put out my uh, assistance for hire right here, like so. And they fit just barely right there. All right. And you want to make sure that the assistant pile that you're shuffling up and drawing from does not have any symbol on the back, that it's just kind of the picture from the front cover of the box. So these specialists or assistants are ones that you can hire and then pay to um, do something for you. So for example, build, but this guy will give you a bottle demon when you build. This is a healer. This guy's just going to give you straight experience. This guy's going to build and heal you for three. Last thing on this board are uh, the settlers. So these people represent essentially the story behind this game is that the town of Monument, which is right here on the back side of the board, was a very prosperous town long ago. And then this crystal meteorite landed and all of these demons kind of leached out of the meteorite, spread across the land and all the settlers had to run. And so they are, Kind of spread throughout the land and they're being terrorized by these monsters and really all they want to do is come back and live in monument so you as the hero are coming back into the land you're helping to rebuild the town defeat the monsters rescue the settlers so on and so forth so the main way to get settlers is to defeat the demons but they're then going to be placed into your houses to again increase your production so the houses give you production and the settlers give you production uh, the pictures at the top really don't matter. They're just for fun. What you care about is the symbol underneath because that represents a resource that you're going to gain every production phase as long as they have a house to live in, which is going to be right here. We'll talk about that in a minute. Okay, so also up here, uh, I have a baggie of my settlers. There's quite a big pile. You could just make a pile of them, um, but it's easier, in my opinion, to have a bag to draw out of. That way you don't have to make sure they're all flipped face down or anything like that. Also, make sure you have your coins somewhere nearby. Um, I have the metal coins from the pre-order. I also have a little container full of experience points here. Uh, and I just realized that I've got a few search tokens here hidden at the bottom that I need to pull out here for just a second. Okay, so I've got my experience and then I have my quest cards. My quest cards are divided up into three groups. Um, you can see standard quests, and then there is the, oh gosh, what are these things called? I can't remember the various types of cards. It is artifact cards and advanced. So these are the artifact cards. These are ones that are gonna give you things that you can use, uh, tools to use on your adventure. These ones are pretty much just gonna give you resources and or end game victory points. And these are gonna be massive victory points but are gonna be harder to uh, complete the quest. So you're gonna wanna make sure you divide those up into three piles, shuffle them up, and then you're going to give everybody six regular quests. One, two, three, four, five, six. And then one of each of the advanced and artifact quests. And we're just gonna set these off to the side. Eventually, we're going to have to pick four of these to carry with us into the game. But we'll look at those in a minute. All right. Moving down here, and again, this is just how I've had this set up. This is a very odd shaped board. Uh, if you were playing multiplayer, obviously you'd wanna make sure that this and this is within reach of all the players. Uh, if you had room, you'd wanna put them side by side, but uh, the size of your table really depends on how you have this all set up. All right, so this is your main board, kind of your, your map area. This is where your hero is going to be traveling around. So let's just go ahead and take our hero, which is just a standee, and put them in the monument. Everybody always starts in the monument, uh, or technically the what used to be the monument. That's where you always start your adventure. It's always gonna be in this area on both sides of the board. But before we get into all that, we need to populate the board with monsters, locations, and search tokens. Now some of that I've already done just for the sake of time. So let's go through it. There's three uh, locations that are not printed on the board. So these three locations here um, and the backside of them just simply 
goes along with the other side of the board. You're just going to shuffle these up and randomly place them out at these locations here with this little banner. All right, that just kind of changes up the way the map looks. Um, gives you a little bit of variety from gameplay to gameplay. That's pretty simple. Then the monsters, you're going to uh, simply gather a certain number of monsters based on the player count. Since I'm setting up for a solo game, I'm playing against a bot. That bot counts as a player, so I have placed two monsters out at every location except for number nine, the big bad guy here is coming out of the meteorite. There's only one of him. <clears throat> Now they have specific locations that they're gonna be each time. So you can see, it's probably hard to see right now. It's not a very, uh, it doesn't really pop, but this has a little like uh, almost jellyfish symbol. That's like the monster symbol with a six next to it. So this has the six monsters. This has an eight next to it. So the eight monsters go here. You can see those are exactly the same. This has the four monsters. Um, three, five. Now, if you're playing on the blue side, the underground side of the board, you want to make sure that monsters two, five, and seven all have the matching back on them. That just gives you a little bit of variety. The basic monsters all have the red crystal on the back. So if you're playing on the flip side, on the green side, all the monsters are going to look like this on the back. Two, five, and seven will look a little different than these two, fives, and sevens. All right. So we've put out our random locations. We've put out our monsters. Also, the Tower of Miners is always gonna be here in the upper left corner. You're gonna to wanna to take these tokens here, give them a shuffle and place them face down. You can see that these symbols are all the same. What's on the other side, uh, we will talk about later, but uh, some big payouts. But there's a reason why they're in the corner because hard to get to and hard to accomplish. Okay, the last thing you are, um, going to want to do is to shuffle up all of your search tokens here. And so I've gone ahead and just kind of shuffled up this pile and you want to make sure that they are all placed face down, which means the one coin and the die symbol with the little kind of attack symbol behind it is face up because what's on the back side is a benefit for searching. So this is a search token. You only use these if you're playing standard mode. If you're playing story mode, when you get to one of these spots where we're gonna be placing a search token, you actually read from the story and the story is gonna give you resources. So this is a way to play, to gain resources for traveling the board without having a story in it. So all you're really gonna do here is just simply go and you can see that each uh, location that I'm putting these on has a letter. So all the ones with the numbers get the same number monster all the ones with the letters are going to get a search token and they start always start with a over here and then work their way um, somewhat across so like I can see a b c d e I know I got to do f and g h i so this one's going to be on Ublo tower j k l m and N. Okay, that way you can make sure you didn't skip any, you didn't miss any, you should have three remaining. I do. These can just go back in the box. All right. That is it for the main board. All right, so we've got the main board covered. Now we've got our player area. And this is, um, you know, probably the most work you're going to do. But setup is not for the faint of heart of this game. There is a lot of cardboard, a lot of tokens to place out. I'm just going to be frankly honest with you. But um, it's a very charming game, so hopefully it's worth it. But my suggestion for you, and I'm still coming up with my full storage solution to the game, but find yourself something like this that's the size of a crayon box. Um, and that's what these are for. These come from Michaels, and these are literally called crayon boxes. They're meant to put crayons in and send off to your kindergartner. But I find them very useful for things like this. This has everything for a single player and Zeke. So basically everything for the blue player plus Zeke. So I've made Zeke. If you're playing with Zeke, you're gonna be the blue player. Now, what does that mean? So let's pull some stuff out of the box here. These are for tracking your reputation and other things in story mode. You don't need these two smaller face tokens. I pulled this out of there, um, obviously, so your standee plus a little plastic stand is good. Then you're gonna get a um, 
wooden token here for each of the um, four main resources. Uh, no, five main resources. There's a hammer in here somewhere. I just gotta find it. Or maybe I'm missing the hammer. Hmm. I appear to be missing my hammer. I'm hoping it's in here somewhere. But your resources essentially are all gonna start at zero. It's kind of fiddly to stack them all up like this. So for now, I'm just gonna place them down below the board. I'm missing a hammer. Hopefully it's in here somewhere. We'll find it. There it is. There's the hammer. All right, so there's our five main resources. Also, you can see that these are the building locations. The building locations, there's four identical sets and each one of them has a different banner on the back. So you can go ahead and divide them up beforehand and this is why I advise you to keep them separated like this because it's very easy just to hand someone a stack and say, here, you're the blue player. And you don't have to separate them out at the beginning of every game. I'm gonna set these off to the side for right now. All right, then each specific character, I've made Zeke blue, is gonna have six uh, character upgrades. Now these are specific to the character. They have this kind of, I don't know, random mountains on the back, darkish mountains, but you can see here that his name is right here. So his name is on all of these. That's what makes them different from these. And you can see the back is different. Um, so you're gonna want to kind of divide these up. There's three blue and three red. And you can see that there's also some pips on the bottom here. So you have to start your upgrades, your personal upgrades with a level one upgrade. And then once you have a level one upgrade, you can move to a level two upgrade and then you can move to a level three. He doesn't have one. So I could, after I purchase toughness, I could purchase either rock shield or climbing claws to put in my blue side over here. So I'm just going to stack those up like that. All right, it's, it's just a good idea to put the, uh, the ones that you have to buy first near the top. Same thing with here. I've got a one, a two, and a three. So I'm gonna put this one on the bottom, kind of stack them up like that. You just need to have them nearby. All right, also, Everybody should get a four-sided die. You wanna put that nearby as well. Everybody's gonna get a heart token. You're gonna to put that at their maximum hearts. So for him, his maximum HP is 13. For others, it's like 11 or 10 or maybe even 15, I think, for the, the cat. Also, each character has a specific number of mana they can hold. Zeke, it happens to be four. So he's gonna get four mana uh, wooden pieces here. They can cover up those slots. So that's how much he can use each round. All right. And then each character is going to get three action tokens. That's these arrows. And these are going to go right here. And so basically you're going to get to take three actions with your hero each round. Every time you take an action with a hero, you're going to have to move them. And so these points are how much movement you can take. Um, for your character and as you spend that action, you cover them up. All right, we'll get into that here in a little bit. So we've kind of set up our, our uh, player board here. You also wanna have a town board. These are all the same, except there is a green side and a blue side. So I'm just playing on the underground. So I'm playing with the underground side of the board face up here. And again, it says to stack your resources here on the zero. Uh, for right now, I've just got them all underneath the board. You also want to make sure you can everybody can have a set of player reference cards here and on the back side of the one of the production phase it has a monster health tracker this is simply just to be used when you're fighting a monster to track their health all right and also um, it says to use a random token there's not many extras in case if you're ever playing with four players you're really either going to have an extra action token or an extra mana token so i use a mana token to track my health all right Last but not least, we are going to put out our um, kind of market of buildings here. Now, this needs to go in a very specific order. So I'm gonna shuffle these up face down. So they're all the same, right? So you and whoever else you're playing with are gonna have the same buildings to choose from, but the order in which they are laid out here just now is very important. 
what you need to do is create a five by four grid. So five rows high, four rows across. Let's just go ahead and start building here. Might need to push these up a little bit. So as I'm building this, I'm gonna explain how it is you go about um, building out your town. The first building that you purchase from this market grid here has got to be on the outer border. So think of this five by four as creating a like picture frame, right? And so all of these on the outside are the picture frame. And what's on the inside is the picture. So you need to purchase a building that makes up the picture frame that goes along the outside. All right, so you cannot start from the middle. You have to start from an edge and purchase one of these buildings. All right. Every building after that needs to be purchased adjacent. Say I start here, my next two options are to purchase here and here. So it's very important which building you start with, not only is it a building you need to afford, a building you can use, but also what's your next options. All right, so say I start here. My next two options are here or here. Say I purchase this one next because it's cheap. I can purchase here or here. Now that I've built up and I say I purchase this one next, then I could go here, here, or here. I can still go back here. Essentially, think of it as you pull away these locations, you're leaving a hole behind, but you want to keep the integrity of the grid intact. And you can purchase a building anytime it's adjacent orthogonally to a hole. All right, it's a little fiddly, but once you start playing, it makes sense. But there's a ton of strategy into what is your first building going to be? Because that makes a huge difference in how you can go about purchasing your buildings and building out your town. While I'm on the subject, when you purchase a building, the first building has to go into this starter row here with the star. So it has to go on one of these locations here. Then, similar to how you have to buy a building adjacent to one you've already purchased, every building you place after that has to be adjacent to this building. You, the settlers don't want to be spread around. They're already terrified of monsters. They want to be huddled close together uh, for security purposes. Think of it that way. So if I put a building here, my next option is to build here or here or here. All right, if I build in the corner, then I can only build here or here. All right, but for end game scoring purposes, for every row above the, uh, I don't get any points for the starting row, but if I completely fill this row with buildings, I get five points. If I completely fill this row with buildings, I get nine points. If I completely fill this row with buildings, I get eight. And this is all, uh, you, if, you, if you filled up both of these, you would get 14. Also, remember how we said we were gonna be placing settlers out? For every building that you have, you can have a settler who lives in it. You don't place the settlers on the building because it would cover up the icons and you wanna be able to see them. So we place our villagers over here and for every set of uh, four unique villagers, because there's four types of resources they could give out. So if you have a unique set of four or a complete set of four who live here, you're gonna get seven points at the end of the game. If you have a complete set of four that live here, you'll get five. Complete set here, you'll get six. So you can see there's how you build out your town is gonna give you end game points. Also, if you say place your buildings here, you get a shell instantly. Whatever you cover up, you instantly get that resource. But there's some times where it says four times the four colon building. That means you have to pay four extra coins to build in this location. Three to build here, two extra coins to build here. Remember, it costs money to build. Not only do you have to pay your assistant five, the bigger number, to exhaust him, to take the build action, you then have to pay for the building. So if then I want to build this one, that's eight total coins, and say for some reason I started here, that's 10, two additional. So I would have to have 10 total coins to take this action. All right, so just something to consider. All right, last thing I wanna talk about briefly is solo. So what are the differences in solo setup versus regular setup? Well, it's actually quite easy. All you really need to do is get this deck of solo automa cards, the ones with the gear on the back. You're gonna give them a shuffle and set them somewhere where you can draw them one at a time each turn. 
after each one of your turns. You're also, they tell you to get a player board, just a random one that's not being used, but the only reason you need that player board is for four specialist slots. And it's entirely a big table hog already. There's no reason for that. Just place you to assistance um, where you can keep track of four across and keeping the integrity of which ones in the left versus the right does matter. So just know that they have four slots to keep assistance. If they gain a fifth one, we have to kick one out. That's it. Other than that, they're gonna gather up some of these guys, but we're not playing against them. We're just simply trying to play around them to score over 100 points in the solo mode. I realized I did skip one thing here, and that was how you go about gaining your two starting assistants. So everybody needs to start with a builder, a starting builder, and a starting healer. Now, the starting builders are all exactly the same. They're all going to cost you five to take their action with a three tax. I'll talk about what tax is here in a minute. But just a simple build action. You see some of these other guys give you other stuff when you build. The healers, however, are uniquely different. They all cost different amounts, and they're all going to give you different bonuses. Um, but each one of these with the heart, with the um, kind of... Uh, what is that? It's not Delta symbol. Um, it's like a little lieutenant symbol in the army, but um, with that symbol, they're going to allow you to fully heal. Whereas, say, this guy just gives you three health back. These guys with that symbol fully heal you. So, this person here, this assistant, is going to give me a full heal plus an experience point. All right, but it's going to cost me five. This one over here would give me a full heal plus a mana back. So, if I've spent a mana, I can actually get it back here. Um, he's only gonna cost me four. The reason you can tell that he's a starter is if you look on the back, the sun symbol is on the back side of all the starting assistants. So you can shuffle up the builders or just let them pick their favorite picture because the builders are all the same. But you do need to shuffle up the starting healers and randomly deal those out. All right, put the rest back in the box. They should not end up in this pile. Okay, at that point, we are all set up. So let's talk about how you go about uh, taking your turn. So there's a few things here that, uh, basically there's two decisions you need to take on your turn. Are you going to take an action with a, uh, I keep saying assistant, but their term is specialist in the game, so my apologies. Are you going to take a specialist action, or are you going to take a hero action? Your hero action is going to be on the board. You're going to be moving your character around and interacting with the board. All right, your specialist is going to be paying to exhaust the specialist and take the action that they have on their card. So this guy would be a build action. This guy would be a heal action. Remember, somewhere out there, there is someone who is a buy gear action. Um, also, as part of the specialist action, you can purchase new specialists. When you purchase a new specialist, you're actually going to recruit them and pay to use them in the same foul swoop. So it's a little misleading. I can't just purchase this builder and place him out on my board for five coins. I actually have to purchase him for five and then pay him five to take the build action. So I actually have to have 10 coins in order to get, say, this guy, or eight to get this guy. When you do, you're going to recruit them to your board, immediately use their action, and immediately exhaust them. As we're talking about specialists real quick, um, let's talk about tax. So you have specialists on your board up to four. The other players, including the solo AI, have specialists on their board. When you want to activate a specialist, you can choose any specialist that is on a player's board that has not been exhausted, so not been flipped over. If you activate your own specialist, you simply pay the number at the top, the larger number in coins to the supply, you activate that specialist. However, if you really want to activate this specialist, all right, say you only have four coins, or you really want the mana back, or say someone else it really wants the experience, and so they're going to want to activate your healer versus their healer. 
you still pay you as the person activating the specialist still pays the number at the top okay that's no different but if it's someone else's specialist that you activate they get that much in tax at the bottom so you pay four but three of it's going to go to this player now when you're playing solo it all goes to the supply you don't have to worry about tax the solo player does not collect money they don't care about any of that um but if you're playing multiplayer and you activate someone else's specialist you exhaust that specialist so they can't use it but they're going to get a little payout for it so this is really the only player interaction other than like running around and taking up uh, search tokens from people or getting to monster tokens before other people there's not a whole lot of player interaction you're really just kind of doing your own thing but you can utilize other people's specialists but it's not a huge take that moment because you're giving them a payout so definitely something you need to consider in the multiplayer game but that is how you use a specialist and that's why the two numbers uh the two coin amounts are on the specialist tokens so again when you are playing uh against another player they get the bottom amount when you're playing against solo ai all of it just goes to the supply um so again your two options are, are you gonna take a specialist action or are you gonna take a hero action? Um, and one quick note, if you have no use for the specialists who are on your board, if you have no use for them, you could go ahead and exhaust them for free and either get two heal or one coin. All right, pretty straightforward. Not much, but just make sure you always use your specialist for something but anytime you use a specialist or recruit a specialist that is your one action for your turn and then the turn passes either to the solo ai or the next person all right if you take a hero action there's a few there there's three things you can do or three things to do one of which is optional two of which you have to do the first thing is move you cannot just squat in one location and continue to activate that same location. All right, you have to move. So at the beginning of the game, I cannot activate the monument location. I have to move. And so that's where these numbers come in here. This is the movement value that I can take and I can decide, but I get a two movement move, a three movement move, and a four movement move as Zeke. These numbers here are uniquely different for each character. All right, so you decide where do I wanna go? All right. So let's just say, hmm, I want to go to the Scholar's Tower first. I want to book. So I'm going to take the two move action to move my person one, two. It's hard to see uh, in the blue, but this map here is broken up into grids. They're like rectangular grids, all right? They're not perfectly square. So this right here that I'm outlining is one grid. The monument sits to the left side of this grid. So to move to Scholar's Tower, I cannot move adjacent, or I cannot move diagonally. I have to go one, two, or I could go one, two. All right, the reason I would want to go this way versus this way is that anytime you pass through a symbol with a mountain, that means rough terrain and it costs you a heart. All right, you expend energy, you expend health crossing the rough terrain. Similar, Anytime you would pass through a space with a um, monster, you're going to get hit. It's going to take like a pot shot at you. You don't have to stop. You don't have to go around them, but just know that similar to mountains. So in this case, to go from here to here, I would take two hearts, actually three, because here's the damage, here's the damage, here's the damage. All right. Either way. You're choosing your action and how far you want to go and you're just kind of sliding this over to know that it's been spent and then you're gonna move you have to move you cannot stay in the same spot okay once you're at that location your one option um, is to play a quest card so let's quickly now talk about these quest cards in our hand 
quest cards um, basically are going to give you end game scoring. They're going to give you um, things that allow you to kind of take additional actions in the game. And they all have a specific location on them. So you can see that this one randomly here is for the Scholar's Tower, which is where I went to. This one is for Estreka, which is over here. This one is for the Tower of Miners, which is over here. Now, you should note that the location names are exactly the same as on this board as on the green side of the board. That way the same quest cards can be used. The locations are slightly in different areas and do slightly different things, but the names are the same. So even though this Scholar's Tower doesn't look like this Scholar's Tower, this is still, I could still play this quest card at this location, okay? So when you play a quest card, you have to be at that location. You have to spend whatever resources are up here in the corner. So in this, I'd actually have to spend or give back an experience point. And then for this one, you're actually really just gaining one end game VP, but also it says, uh, there's a little flavor text here. You request aid from the librarians, but then it says gain one coin per quest card you have completed, including this card. So you actually wouldn't want to do this one first. You would want to hold on to this one and do it after you've accumulated like four or five quest cards or completed four or five quest cards. Then this one's going to get you like five coins. Right now it would only get me one. All right. But you can play a quest card. All right. Up to one. Because you can see here, let's find... Uh, actually, this is a great uh, example of some really good shuffling because I don't have any repeated things, but there's a very good chance you may have two Scholar's Tower quest cards in your hand. If I come to the Scholar's Tower and play one, remember, I'm going to have to leave, go somewhere else for a turn, and then come back to play that second one. But once you have... Um, played it for the most part, it can just be tucked away where you'll remember to score the end game VP. Now, see some of them give you things like a crystal. Uh, this one is going to give you an actual combat that you have to uh, come across. So this one is the Guruguri Bat, and it says a Cyclops Bat is stealing away unknown travelers. So you have to complete a combat 14 with an attack 5. Essentially the same statistics that are on a monster token here are on this card. And it's going to give you as a reward a book two survivors and one shell okay but then there are things like the uh, advanced quest cards these ones almost always cost two books to complete and books i'll be honest with you are the hardest resource to come by also the little asterisk means you look down here and it says have at least seven unspent tools well that means you have to have your tools all the way up here and have not used them not turn them in for money, not spent them on anything else. So if I have my tools, at least here, and I have two books, so this is what my resource track would have to look like, all right? Then I can spend the two books, one, two, I don't have to spend the tools, but then I'm gonna get 10 points at the end of the game. Big payout. The last ones are the artifacts here. If I say go to the under garden, pay my two books, not only do I get five game VP, but now, as an ongoing thing, I can once per season, you may not have more than your max mana, any extras lost, I can turn one mana into five. So essentially I'm refreshing myself. So Zeke only has a maximum of four, but say I'm down here like this, and I have uh, completed this card, I could say, ooh, I want some more mana back, I'm gonna spend my one, and this is gonna give me a full refill here. Now, technically, I'm supposed to leave that on the card, so I remember that I've used it. Um, but that's why there's extra mana in the box. Okay. So, and just a quick note, harking back to setup. When you're dealt these eight cards, you have to pick four of them and only carry four with you into the start of the game. The rest of them are discarded. So keep that in mind. You can keep whatever four you want. You can keep all four basic ones. You can completely trash the harder ones to do. It's up to you. But where you, which ones you choose to keep is really going to give you a course of action as to where you travel on the map. Okay, so you've moved. You have optionally played a quest card. The last thing you need to do is either visit the location, search, 
or fight an enemy. Now, it does not say in the rule book what happens if you end up, say, on this space. Say I am trying to get to the Tower of Miners here, and this is just the straightest course of action, and I need to move here, and I'm I'm on a space that doesn't have a search token, that doesn't have an enemy, and doesn't have a location to visit. I'm assuming you just get a pass. But um, if you end up at a location with an enemy, you have to fight it. Um, that I know for sure. I believe the other two are also optional. So if I want and end up here at the Scholar's Tower, I can pay three coins to gain a book. I can only do that once. I can't pay six coins to get two. You can only activate a location once, but I'm pretty sure that's optional. It's not explicitly stated in the rule books, but that's how I've been playing it. Because what if I don't have three coins? Same thing for if I'm at a location with a search token. Again, if this was story mode and I ended up here, I'd read intra or I'd read chapter or paragraph D for Zeke in chapter say one. When you're here, you're simply going to roll the, your D4 and you're gonna take the amount of damage that you roll. So in this case, three damage, one, two, three. But then you would gain a coin and you'd get to flip that over and gain whatever's on the other side. You also get to keep that search token as part of your tableau because it's gonna give you that same coin. Actually, you don't get the coin now, I'm sorry. The coin comes during every production phase. So you get what's on the underside and you're gonna gain a coin during every production phase. All right. Um, okay. So those are your three um, options for things you can do once you have moved and or played a quest card. You can activate a location, you can fight a monster, or you can do a search token. If you happen to be where there is not one, I'm assuming you just do nothing. Now for the most part, all of these locations have symbols that make sense. Um, and there's explanations of those symbols in the rule book. The one thing I do want to point out that I didn't quite get at first, but is uh, pretty easy to understand once somebody points it out to you. For example, here, this symbol here is a quest card. This is not end game VP, but what this eyeball symbol underneath it with the number means is that you draw three, you get to look at three cards, you pick one. So if I come here to the Hermit's Hut, I'm going to gain a experience point and I'm going to have to look at three cards to keep one. Uh, same thing over here I in the snail caves if I spend two experience I can look at two to keep one and get six coins. So um, you know a little bit of a, a different scenario there but the eyeball uh, symbol is uh, something to pay attention to. All right so we, again, are just going around the table or back and forth between us and the solo AI. And we are either taking a specialist action or we're taking a hero action, all right? Your hero can only take three actions unless you have like some unique good or gear or something like that gives you extra actions. You basically take three actions. Each one of them has a unique amount of movement you can take. Um, you don't have to say you have saved your four and you only wanna move two spaces. You don't have to take the all the movement, but you can't take more. So if you left if you left yourself with two and you want to go three spaces, tough cookies. You didn't plan your uh, round out very well. Okay, there are some actions that you can take anytime uh, during the game. They can be taken on your turn. They can be taken on somebody else's turn. These are called anytime actions. So what are your anytime actions? Well. Anytime you want to, you can sell your goods at the market for coins, okay? So you simply just move them down the resource track, whatever combination you want to sell, and you gain the coins. Also, as you rescue settlers here, you can just place them out in front of you. They don't have to be placed into town. There actually has to be a building that they can live in before you can place them in town, all right? But once you have a building and a place to put them at any time, you can take a settler from in front of you and place them here. Because remember, you wanna place them out in nice, neat patterns. 
So you don't just want to, even if you have this bottom row filled up with buildings, you don't necessarily want to throw the first three people because the first three people you get may be two shells and a, uh, a tool. And then you're kind of breaking your ability to get a nice, uh, neat set. But the only way a settler gives you resources during the production phase is if they are placed into town. So if you have a settler in front of you and you're approaching the production phase, if you're getting ready to pass, you may want to, if you can, go ahead and put them out there just so you can gain that resource. Okay? You can also, anytime, even on someone else's turn, spend your experience to upgrade your hero. So remember here, there is a certain order in which you have to use your upgrades based on these pips. And you can see here, the toughness takes one experience. This one takes two experience. You simply turn in your experience and you get to place that on your board. If it's a red one, you're going to cover up uh, one of these here of your choice. Okay, but more than likely, your upgraded abilities are gonna be better than your starting combat abilities. Your blue ones, which are kind of gear or passive things, you start with none, so you just pick a spot to stick them in. Okay, you can also complete an order. So orders are these tokens up here. If you make it up to the Tower of Miners, you're going to be given the chance to claim uh, an order token and it's gonna cost you something like, say, four crystals or something like that. And once you've acquired four crystals, you can complete the order, spending those crystals, it's gonna give you a big payout, okay? But again, you can do that at any point, it doesn't even have to be your turn. The last thing you can do is pay two experience, now I do not advise this, but you might be desperate, you can pay two experience to refresh the settlement or settlers row here. As you are drawing settlers for, say, defeating monsters, you're gonna be pulling them off one or two at a time, but you're not gonna be refilling this row. As you pull out, as you recruit a specialist, you're gonna refill the row. As you buy gear, you're gonna refill the row. As you rescue settlers, you're not gonna refill the row until it is empty. So say you are looking for a specific settler to say complete your set, or you really need a specific resource, you may be worth it to pay two experience to refresh this row in order to have better choices, all right? But again, that is an any time action. All right, so we've talked about uh, the actions you can do, uh, whether it's a specialist action or a hero action and your any time actions. So let's talk um, about combat. So if you end up in a space with a monster um, and you need to fight that monster, it's very straightforward. You're gonna take your monster health tracker here. In this instance, we would put it at 12 because this guy has 12 health. And then you're gonna take your four-sided die and you're gonna roll it. All right, in this instance, I got a two. So I'm doing a sand strike, which is gonna hit him for three. One, two, three, but he's hitting me for five. One, two, three, four, five. Obviously, this would not be a fight that I would go looking for in my current state without any upgrades, without any shields. This would be a bad idea. But your hits against the monster and their hits against you happen simultaneously. So it's not like you don't have the opportunity to dodge. It's also not like you can uh, make the killing blow and still survive, all right? So keep that in mind that you know how much damage they're gonna do. They're not rolling a die. Uh, they're simply doing X number of damage based on this little symbol with the flame. So like this guy does six every turn. Um, you, however, it's gonna be random based on your four-sided die, which attack you're gonna do. So this may bother some people, but it does make the game a little more interesting. Now, again, remember, as you say upgrade your character, you're gonna be upgrading these options. As you say purchase uh, gear, if I say buy the Royal Pike and put it have put it here and rolled a two, I would have done seven damage. Also, you can see a lot of the gear here is mainly shields. So if I bought the pack bird, 
that's going to give me one passive shield. So this five, say I'm at full health, just becomes a four. One, two, three, four. If I have all three of these and all three of these slots filled, the five just becomes a two. All right. So combat is very straightforward. The only randomness in it is you rolling your four-sided die and which one of these four are you going to do. Now, if you've upgraded your character to the nines, uh, you should be okay. But don't go trying to take on this level nine guy with 21 health and seven attack unless you have. All right, it's just not gonna happen. So, um, and I misspoke earlier. I said, if you were in a location with a monster, you had to fight it, you do not. Um, but you are gonna take a heart one point of damage from hanging out with a monster. So if you pass through a monster or you end up hanging out with a monster, you take a point of damage. Okay, so that is combat. All right, and the last thing that we need to talk about is your special ability. So Zeke here, he's a geomancer seeking a way to escape a prophesized doom. That's gonna deal with his story mode. We're not getting into that. But down here, you can see he has Farsight. I can pay one mana to draw a quest card limit once per season. So again, that is, it says limited once per season. Not all of them are. But if I wanted to, I could pay a mana, set it off to the side, and draw a quest card and keep it. Okay, everybody's special action is unique. Now, this is not stated in the rule book but I believe that this action and also an action from an artifact like this is considered an anytime action. I've asked for clarification and I am waiting on an answer. Um, so if I get an answer before I publish this video, I'll try and put it in the subtitles. But I believe that taking your special action because some of them are not, um, for example, I played a game with, um, uh, what's his name, man, Mandor or something like that. And his was spend a mana to get plus two movement. So obviously you would only do that when you're already taking your action. But these artifacts are my biggest concern is, is using an artifact considered your full action? Is it like an, 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 a specialist action or is this an anytime action? Excellent question for Ryan Lockett and I have asked. So waiting for an answer. Okay. So we have covered a lot. This is by no means a lightweight game. This is kind of like a heavy Euro game with this little narrative driven aspect to it if you so choose. If you play in standard mode, it's kind of like a heavy, a heavy Euro at its core. Once everyone has taken the turns that they want to take and passed, all right, you move into production phase. Production phase is pretty straightforward. Um, the first thing you're going to do is you're going to produce goods. So you're going to look at your buildings, anything that's in this little gray box. So this one would produce a crystal, this one a bottle demon, uh, this one a tool, this one a shell. You're going to gain those resources pushing your thing up the track. All right. Any settlers that you have settled into town, you're going to gain their resources. Okay, so you're gonna boom, 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 add up your resources. Every search token that you have claimed, you're gonna gain a coin for, okay? That's pretty much it. Uh, I have yet to come across any that give you anything in between, but I think there is some gear, like during the production phase, it might give you a heart or something. Um, for example, this, where is one of the buildings gives you, this building here is gonna give you five hearts, so you would heal up then. That's the only way you get health back though. If you have gotten all the way down to one health and then passed, say if you have this building, you would go back up to six, but you don't heal back up unless you use a healing specialist. Okay, so keep that in mind. You do get to refresh your mana during every production phase. So refill your mana up to your maximum. You get to refresh all your action tokens. You get to flip back over and refresh all of your specialists. And then you're gonna move the season marker to the next round and begin a next round. Okay. So we have talked about everything that there is to talk about as far as how to play the game. Let's just very quickly go over how to run the solo AI. And it's very simple, very straightforward. You're simply gonna flip over one of these cards and do what it says. 
most of what it is is either going to be exhausting specialists, taking out enemies, or taking out search tokens. That's really all it is. Occasionally they might uh, uh, call off, um, they might recruit a specialist until they, so they, remember, can have up to four. They might get rid of some gear, so you see more gear. They might get rid of some uh, quest cards so that those get shuffled through. But for the most part here, you're just flipping this over and doing what it says. Now, some things to consider. If it says to flip over and exhaust your specialist, you get the tax. So if his card says exhaust your leftmost specialist, I flip this guy over, but I'm gonna get three coins for him doing so, okay? If it says flip over his specialist, he just flips it over, nothing happens, okay? But as we spoke earlier, if I choose to activate his specialist, he doesn't get the tax, he doesn't care about it. I just pay it all, but I can use his specialist. That's why we do need to keep track of his four and which four he has. And at any point, if his says recruit a specialist and he already has four, you as the player get to choose which one is kicked out. Okay, and then really the last thing that you need to keep up with is that it doesn't uh, ever pick left or right. It's always gonna pick the left uh, specialist here and add it to its player board. Now, technically the game, the instruction manual does not say shift over and refill from the right, but that's what I do. That way, these three guys don't say stagnant and the only one I ever see refreshed is this one. I think that makes much more common sense for the game. Um, so that's a little house rule of mine. For the settlers though, it has a priority order of which ones it wants to take. It always wants crystals first, then I think bottle demons, then shells, or no, then tools, then shells, I think. Um, so you just go through the priority order. Also with the monsters, it always just wants to go for the easiest monster. So it always starts with the ones, it will get rid of two ones before it moves on to the twos, wherever the twos are. And then it'll just get rid of the twos. It will never just randomly take out the nine. Um, it's never gonna get that high. At the end of the day, this guy really is just here to kind of mix things up for you, to take some things away, to uh, make you have to go around them, uh, but also to help refresh the market board, things like that, see new stuff as a solo player. At the end of the day, as a solo player, you're just attempting to score over 100 total points, um, and then from there, see how many better you can do. But the AI does not accumulate a score. They don't accumulate anything except their specialists that you care about, and it's pretty simple. You're gonna reshuffle these cards during every production phase, uh, just flip it over and do what it says. So very simple AI. Uh, I'm not a huge fan of the beat your own score mechanic, but I feel like once I have gotten through playing enough standard mode, I'm gonna jump into narrative mode and I'm not gonna care about my score. I'm gonna care about the journey. So, all right. With all that out of the way, let's go ahead and play through a round or two so you guys can see what uh, that looks like. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. Just uh, two quick housekeeping things that I discovered. Um, one thing I forgot is that you start the game with 17 coins. So give everybody 17 coins. Again, the AI does not eat anything. And for the underground board here, Estreka is where the order tokens uh, are obtained. Uh, on the other side of the board, it's the Tower of Miners. So this little pile has been moved and I forgot to mention that I had given myself 17 coins. Otherwise, let's get started. You always uh, start as the first player. Uh, that is what this little symbol here means under the monument, that if you take the monument action, you gain the first player token, um, but that's not needed in the solo game because you always get to go first. So my first action is going to be hero action. I'm gonna go ahead and uh, do that right there to go one, two. Uh, again, if I had gone this way, I would have had to take one damage from the mountains. But I'm here at the Scholar's Tower. I don't have any uh, quest cards. Uh, I'm looking for Estreka is where I'm hoping to end up here at the end of this turn. I wanna come back to the monument next turn and then kind of Hermit's Hut Tower of Miners 
towards uh, the third round. So I'm gonna kind of go this way, come back, and then move over here is kind of my my uh, guidance for the moment. Um, so actually, before I do anything, I wanna take an anytime action, use my Farsight, pay one mana to draw a quest card, just in case it's at the Scholar's Tower. So I got rid of my artifact one, so I'm gonna draw another one. And this one is in the Snail Caves, which is way over here. Um, I do just get to keep that, uh, so that's fine. It wasn't at the Scholar's Tower. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and take this action to pay three, make some change here to gain a book. So I'm on the board with books. Books are the hardest resource to gain uh, because they don't come as part of a normal production. You know, there's no settlers who give you books. Books represent the knowledge that you gain from exploring around. Obviously the Scholar's Tower is gonna give you that knowledge, but they're very hard to come by. So, and I need one here, at least one, to do what I wanna do this turn, or this season. Okay, so my turn is done. Let's get some ambiance here. This is the Wandering Sea soundtrack from the Sleeping Gods Kickstarter, in case you were wondering. Um, this was uh, composed by Mallory Lockett, who is Ryan Lockett's wife. All right, so I'm just gonna highlight these early on, and then um, after that, I'm gonna stop uh, showing them off so much. But this one says, the bot exhausts their leftmost specialist if all of theirs are exhausted, it, it moves to you um, and you gain the tax, but it's got some, so it's gonna go here and exhaust that guy. Okay, all right, so I now want to go ahead and take my four movement action. So I'm gonna go one, two, three, four. I did pass through a mountain, so I have to take a hit there. And now I am at the Ublo Tower which I don't have, let me just double check. Nope, don't have a Ublo Tower thing. So I could either activate this uh, thing to take a hit for a, um, uh, take a damage for a tool, or I could do a search, but I can't do both. One of my things here, uh, my big payout one, I need to have seven unspent tools, so I need to start accumulating tools. Plus I don't plan on fighting anything this turn, so I'm gonna take the hit to get on the board with tools. All right, as you can see, turns go pretty quick. So let's go ahead and he is going to recruit specialist. The bot recruits the leftmost available specialist and exhausts that specialist immediately. Um, so he's going to take this funky looking robot builder here. He's going to exhaust him. We're gonna put him right there. Now. It doesn't say to do this in the rule book, but I'm thinking like, why wouldn't you do this? So this is one of my house rules here, is to shift them down and bring the new guy out. All right, my turn. Um, do I wanna go ahead and pay for that builder now? So see, he does a lot of exhausting of specialists, the AI does. Um, and so I wanna be able to build this turn. Now if I build with this guy, and I build the building I wanna build, it's gonna cost me 11. I've got 11. But if I get this specialist here, it's gonna cost me eight plus six is 14, which I have, but then I have no additional money to do what I want to do here in the next round. So. I think we are gonna hold off, which is a shame, but I'm gonna take my specialist action and I'm gonna pay this guy five. So throw this over here and make change. So I activated him for five, no tax or anything. And now I have to choose something from the outer edge. I am going to choose this building here, okay? And it has to go somewhere down here on this bottom row with the star. Now it would be pretty silly to go here because I'd have to pay two extra coins. I'm gonna go right here and gain a shell. So there we go. Um, not a, I, I love these screen printed resource things. I like their size of them, but compared to the resource track, I'm not a fan that really, you can only have one per slot and so you kind of stack them up and it makes it a little fiddly. But otherwise I don't gain anything right now for this. 
uh, I will gain a tool during the production phase and now I have a building that a settler can go into so all right okay <clears throat> so let's ongoing snail caves that is a nice thing but I'm gonna need to come up with two more books to get there I don't know how I'm gonna do that um, there's like no more books unless I come back and fight this guy. Anyways, all right, so that was my action. I took a specialist action, so now we need to give the AI his turn. He is searching. The bot claims the search token closest to your hero. Pretty simple, they don't do anything with it, so it's gonna take away this one right next to me. I'm just gonna make a pile off to the side. Discard pile, okay. Um, all right, so I'm gonna go ahead and take my other your action and go three one two actually I can go this way one two three take no heart hits okay and so before we take that action I can take my optional action to play a quest card so I'm in Estreka I have to pay a book which I have so there we go I paid my book this is gonna be worth two VP at the end of the game I share your knowledge for a good deal at the market gain any gear token on the gear board at a cost of negative five. So, um, and I forgot, I just now realized I forgot to pay for my building, but we're covered now. All right, so I could buy anything up there. Um, the question is, do I get the pack bird, which is gonna give me shielding and plus one movement, or do I go ahead and take something like the Scaled Sword, which is gonna give me a huge uh, benefit if I roll the number that it's gonna be on. Um, you know, th these are such tough choices here. But I know that most of the blue items are gonna be shields. That scaled sword is quite amazing. Being able to do 12 damage in one foul swoop. Zeke has a decent kind of mana pool here. I really would love that. And see, the problem is, is that the AI is going to get rid of those bottom two. And those are the two I want. So I have to make a decision because more than likely they're not going to stick around. I think the scaled sword is too good to pass up. So I'm going to pay my one because it's a five discount to get the scaled sword. Now the question is, where do I wanna put this? So I think, unfortunately, it's gonna to have to go over top of Pebbled Storm, which is the only attack that comes with a built-in defense, but only hits for one. And that's just not good enough, so. We're gonna be looking for fours. Looking for fours, okay. All right. But uh, that was my quest card, which was optional. So let's put this off somewhere separate. Now I can take this. So I will gain a heart, right? It's not spend a heart because it's not on the outside of the arrow. So it's just gain a heart and then I get to look at two order tokens and pick one and keep one. So let's just take a look at these here. Now we can lift them up. So I'm gonna be looking to either get, spend three tools and two shells to get 13 coins or two bottle demons and two tools to get uh, 16 coins. Now I can easily, now shells are pretty easy to come by and I've already got tool production. So I think I'm gonna stick with this one. It's only a difference of three coins. So yeah. This one just uh, gets discarded. Okay, so that now is, uh, I feel like a very productive phase in Estreka. Let's go ahead and push these down and refill here again. Um, it does not tell you to push, it just tells you to refill. But again, I feel like this seeing more stuff in the AI, not always just picking from the bottom and the top ones would just stay there forever, makes more sense in my opinion. All right, let's see what the bot is doing. Um, I gotta turn on the next song, attack, first time. So it only attacks one uh, enemy per round. 
And so this basically says if this is the first time, it attacks the lowest monster on the board and just simply removes it. So we'll just move that off to the side. Pretty straightforward. The AI again, very quick turns here. Okay, so I have taken all of the um, hero actions I can take. Um, unfortunately, I don't really have much else I can spend my mana on. I've already done my far sight once per season. Um, and I only have two money to my name. Now, I could start selling stuff here, but remember, I want to get these accumulated, both of them. There's no reason for me to pay to activate that guy um, or that guy. And so I am done. So I'm gonna pass. Anytime you pass, the AI automatically passes as well, and that's going to end the round. All right, so let's go through the production phase. This one time is gonna be very straightforward, and then we'll probably skip over it um, if we show any more phases after this. So um, collect produced goods. We're really only talking about one tool here. Okay, not much there. Um, all right, refresh spent mana. Check. Uh, reset hero actions. Check. Refresh specialists. Us and him. Okay. So I forgot about that. I forgot his specialist here gave me bottled demons. It could have been a pretty easy way for me to get bottled demons is simply just activate his specialist. But that's fine. All right. Um, and then we move the season marker and we are ready to go. Uh, we don't move, we stay on that spot uh, and we don't refresh health. Um, so we are good to begin the next phase. All right, so I think I almost am just gonna kind of backtrack through the same things here. So one, two, three, yeah, let's start by spending our three here. One, two, three. I'm going to spend a heart to gain a tool. And that's it, that's all I can do. I don't have anything for Ublo Tower here. I'm running away from the snail caves, which I hate, but I don't have two books. Okay, oops, and I forgot to shuffle these. So that that's something you should do as part of the production phase, is shuffle these up. All right, so he is searching, claims the closest search token. This one, that's all he does. He just removes stuff from you, gets in your way. All right, then, yep, I'm going to spend my four one here. And it really doesn't matter. One, two, three, four. So I've come here. I had to go through the mountain, but now I'm here. Uh, and since I'm not, I, I'm gonna fight the thing. If I had chosen to activate the nomad camp, I would have taken another hit. But I am gonna fight this uh, level one demon here. So let's get this card out. Put this at level seven. And let's get my die and hope for a four. And we got a four. Boom! <laughs> we crushed this thing in a one foul swoop. I do have to take two points of damage, one, two, but I'm okay with that. Oh, that was awesome. All right, so as a reward, I don't need to keep this or anything, but um, I'm going to gain a person here, and I think I need three and two. I can get it that way, so I think but I could really use, yeah, I'm gonna need some tools. Seven unspent tools. So yeah, let's let's take this guy with the hard hat here. And now, normally I could put him in front of me or I can go ahead and slot him in because he has a house to stay at. So he's got this, I feel like he would live there. All right, so we're done with this. I can simply be discarded. I do gain one experience, right? Yeah. One experience, just as a resource to spend later. Let's move this out of the way. And that was my turn. All right, roll a die. So roll this, and it's a one. The bot claims the next order token, so it just kind of steals that one away from me. 
this card. Okay, check. Oh boy. And then the last thing I want to do, yep, that was perfect, worked out, is go one, two, one, two. Unfortunately, we take a hit from the mountain, but now we are in Monument. So I'm gonna play this quest, which means I have to trade in my experience I just gained, but now I have helped them repair a drill to mine deep below the monument. Ongoing, I'm going to uh, get plus one coin during every production phase. So that's good, that's a good start. All right, also, I'm going to gain the first player token, doesn't matter, I'm gonna gain four hearts back. So seven up to 11, so that's good. And then this other symbol here means that I can swap any two uh, buildings. Remember, these were randomly assigned to this grid. And so the question is, what I would really love one that's pretty cheap that I can get a book. And I think I know exactly which one I'm gonna go for. Because this is one that's gonna give me plus one movement. So I'm gonna swap out this one that's very expensive and put this one right here. Perfect. Okay. All right, so there we go. We're done with that. And yeah. I really need one more freaking person. Um, yeah, I'm gonna go ahead while we're at it, take my anytime action to draw a quest card. I just need some resources. I'm gonna go for a simple one. City of Spirits was way back up there. That's a bottle demon every production phase. That's not bad either, but that costs a lot. And that's far away from me. All right, anyways, that was my turn. Exhaust the specialist. The bot exhausts their leftmost specialist. I really want them to exhaust my leftmost specialist, to be perfectly honest with you. Um, because I have got no monies. I could trade in like two of these and still have enough to do what I need to do. But I'm trying to get to seven. But if I trade in two of these, that's four money. That gives me six total. That's barely enough to just pay for this fella here. Not enough to get out what I need, which is one of those two buildings, three or four. So what I could really use is the AI to go ahead and uh, activate my person. Unfortunately, I'm kind of at an impasse here where I don't have much I can do. Taking an anytime action does not count as my turn. And so I could take some anytime actions, trade in for some money, but It's not helping me. Hmm. Okay, so this is what we're gonna do. We are going to, yeah, take an anytime action here to trade in two tools and a shell. I'm gonna move this like this, one, two, for seven total money, all right? So now I've got nine total money. I am going to activate this guy here, spending five, okay? Normally I would have paid that person a tax, but I don't have to I actually gain a bottle demon out of it, which right now is just money I could get back. So I could now immediately trade in the bottle demon for two more coins, but I don't need it. I'm going to pay these four exactly right here. One, two, three, four wipe me clean and I'm gonna pick up this guy right here and I'm gonna play him right here not only is that gonna give me an immediate shell but it's gonna give me the other shell I need during the production phase and I should get two more so I will be able to at this you know basically middle of the production phase uh, or the start of my turn get 13 coins so all right so that was a specialist action that I took. So the bot is going to take another action and they are, again, recruits the leftmost available specialist and exhausts that specialist. Okay, so they're taking this healing lady here and just exhausting her. 
bringing out some new options. Okay. Ooh, the tool ain't, ain't that bad. I could use some tools. All right, and I pretty much don't have much else to do now, but um, I can heal back up or get some money. So trying to think about what I want to accomplish next round. So let's spend one of these guys to heal, get up to full health, one, two, without having to spend any money. That was a specialist action. I rested that specialist to get the two hearts. So now he is searching. That's not what I wanted him to do. So he's gonna take this one off the board. Then I'm gonna take this guy, see, and that's the thing. I, I can only rest my specialists, and now at this point, I have nobody he can use to pay me attacks. So he's gonna take one more action, which is exhaust their leftmost specialists, um, which is this guy, and also says it's going to discard and redraw the bottom two again. It says to discard these two and fill in here. I like to push these down like so and redraw from the top. Okay. Ooh, those weapons are pretty, pretty good. Okay. All right. But at this point, I have nothing left I can do. So let's now push. This is probably going to be the third and final season I'm going to do for this video. Um, but I'm going to do production and be right back. All right, so here we are entering the third season. You can see I've refreshed my mana, I've gained my resources, and I've refreshed all the specialists, shuffled that deck. So we are good to go. I am going to start with an anytime action here of fulfilling this. So I'm going to zero out all of my goods here to gain 13 coins, which is just a really good payout. Uh, these orders are a great way to get a good chunk of change which hopefully you can do a lot with. Also, it's going to be 2 VP at the end of the game. All right. So I need to think about now where I kind of want to go, what I want to do. So I'm thinking I need some books because I eventually want to make it back over here, snail caves with my books. So I'm going to go one, two, or no, one, two, go that way. Spend three coins. Wait, before I do that, let's spend our mana and we'll do this one. Ublo Tower, okay. Not super helpful. But I paid my money, give me my book. Whoops. All right. There we go. Okay, AI's turn. He is exhausting their specialist, leftmost, this one, and discarding these two right away. So again, push down. Otherwise, if you had done exactly as the card had said, the two that came out, Meteor Mall and Meteor Vest, would have immediately, before I even had a thought and a prayer to pick them up, would be gone. Um, plus one max mana if Azure Coat is equipped. Azure Gloves, gain one heart when you search. Plus one max mana. Hmm. Okay. All right. Um, so it's my turn. You want to go ahead and get that other book and get plus one movement. But I don't really need it right now. So one, two, three. Yeah. Two, three. Yeah, let's do it that way. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and spend my one, two, three to go one, two, three. I went through a big giant bug. So I take a hit. I'm at the Tower of Miners. And so I can play this quest card. I have to take two more hits. One, two, two. You seek hidden veins of rare crystals. That's gonna be plus one to the end of the game. Plus I'm finally on the board with a crystal. There you go which they're pretty good payout. Um, okay, 
I also, now that I'm here, can purchase a gear. So I don't need a specialist. I can purchase a gear just spending the money outright. And the question is, I, I'm thinking it's going to be mech armor. Um, so let's, let's trade this in for seven change. And I really like this guy here. And so let's replace number two. Okay, and we will refill here. Okay, flame saber, that's another good one. All right, okay. And so that was my turn. They are searching. So they're taking this away. I really have not done any searching this game at all, which is kind of hurting me because I'm not having any coins during the production phase. But I've already resounded myself to, yeah, getting another crystal. All right. So unfortunately, I have this four point of movement. One, two, three, four, five. I don't think I'm ready to get all the way up there, though. One, two, three, four, five. Yeah, I think I just need to take this one guy out, make it easy on myself. Um, yeah, one, two, three, four, five, six. Yeah, there's no way to get here. Okay, so I'm gonna spend four. It's a complete waste, but I'm gonna move over here and take this guy out. So let's just bring this back up real quick. He's at nine. And I'm looking for fours and twos, and I get a one, which is okay, because I got mana to spare. So I'm gonna hit him one, two, three, and then I can spend one mana for two more. Boom, boom, and he's gonna hit me for two. Now, I would have had to have rolled mech armor to get the two shield. Um, so, unfortunately, that's why getting the gear shields are better if you want a consistent shield, but that's fine. All right, I rolled a one again. Okay, wait, one, two, three, one, two, yeah. All right, so I can do the same thing again, basically pay my one mana, knock him out, he's gonna hit me for two, one, two. Okay. All right, T. So, I've taken this guy out. He's going to give me one person, but I'm actually gonna take this person here me a crystal because they're probably worth the most in exchange otherwise this guy is useless and that was my turn come on exhaust one of my people here attack first time not helpful all right so it's actually attacking the same person I was so there we go all right um, uh, So if I activate his guy again, I spend five, get a bottle demon out of it. I've got four here. I really want this book. I'm thinking that's just what I'm gonna need to go for. Um, I have to come back with the tools. So yeah, let's go ahead and activate his specialist as my action. So I'm gonna pay five. I get a bottle demon out of it. Okay, and I'm gonna pay three. One, two, three. Okay, to take this hut here. Now the question is, where do I wanna start going with this? Um, I think I'm actually gonna go right here to start working my way over here. So I'm gonna put you there. That's gonna gain me a book instantly. And then plus one movement for the rest of the game. So that's nice. All right, so I've taken my action. Let's see what the bot, are you gonna help me out? Attack first time. So when that comes up the second time, you simply discard it and draw a card. And he is taking, taking the search token closest to me, which is not helpful. 
He has yet to activate my people in order to give me that bonus. So I'm gonna go ahead and flip this guy. because There's nothing I can afford or want to afford. Unless that's really not too bad. Let's think about this. If I sell a bottle demon and a crystal, it's so gonna give me four or five. So I need to sell two bottle demons and a crystal to get six, seven. I could purchase that girl, an activator, giving me two experience. And two health. That's not a bad deal. Experience can be very useful. I'm trying to see what my uh, other things here, like rock shield, would be very good to have. So I would need to do toughness first. So let's do that, because there's nothing else I need bottled demons for right now. Or crystals. Okay, so I'm going to zero out these things to get uh, essentially six coins. Yeah, there's really no other good. If I had had one more crystal, I could have gotten 14 out of that instead of six. But there's no other way for me to get a crystal right now, unfortunately. But I've got my seven now, so I can pay that six right back because that was an anytime action. Now I'm taking a specialist action to purchase this one, immediately activate her for two health, boom, boom, and two experience. All right, and that was my action. Okay, so let's see what they're gonna do now. Exhaust, the bot exhausts their leftmost specialist. Son of a stinker. Again, you're not doing what I want you to do. All right, I need my books, can't sell books anyways, can't sell your knowledge. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead as an anytime action and upgrade my toughness here, which really is not helpful right now. I'm really only doing this so I can get this out of the way to get to rock shield. Um, but yeah, I'm just kind of done. I'm out of stuff I can do. Um, other than exhaust these guys. So let's exhaust this guy for two, boom, boom. Let's see what he's doing. Exhaust your specialist, finally. This is what I was looking for. The bot exhausts your leftmost specialist, if available, and you gain the tax. So he is finally going to exhaust this guy, and I get three money. Otherwise, if he had not, um, I would have simply exhausted that guy for one money. So bonus two money for me, and we're off to a good start. All right. Um, unfortunately, I literally have nothing else left to do. Um, let's push this down. Let's see what. Okay. If that had been like a gear person, I maybe could have afforded them, but probably not the gear itself. So. We are done. Uh, I am done. That was half a game right there. So I'm going to stop the video here. This is meant to just be a tutorial video and a way to show off the underground board. Um, if you would like to see a full playthrough of Now or Never, please check out my next video, which is going to be uh, chapter one of story mode of one of the characters. I haven't decided yet which one it's going to be. But um, so that one will be include spoilers. So just know that for now, I will be reading through the text all that stuff on camera. So um, keep that in mind. But um, we're going to stop here for now. I know this one has gone on long, but I wanted to do, tell you how to play and then show you some examples. And I think I covered everything there is to cover, especially for solo as well. So if you enjoyed this video, please consider giving it a thumbs up. And if you'd like to see more videos like this in the future, including a full playthrough uh, on story mode, please consider subscribing to the channel. Once again, thanks for watching. Have a great day.